Join me along the broken road with the Broken Vessels podcast. Jeremiah 18.4 states, And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. This is the Broken Vessels Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Simpkins. This is a podcast where we have discussions on theological themes for the broken to bring encouragement and hope in Christ. Well, I would like to say good morning. And welcome to another edition of Along the Broken Road with the Broken Vessels podcast. I'm currently traveling along I-75 North, uh, just uh, outside of Somerset, Kentucky, on my way back up to Georgetown. It's a beautiful morning. The sun is shining. It's a uh, really beautiful uh, 47 degrees out right now. Definitely not as warm at the moment as it has been here. We had a little bit of a temperature drop yesterday. It was pretty chilly out. In fact, uh, my wife and I uh, went to our son's soccer game and sat in uh, drizzly rain and high winds and overcast. And it was saying it was 57, 58 degrees, but it sure felt a whole lot colder than that. But we powered through and we won the game. So that was good. Well, what I want to talk to you about today is understanding and dealing with our weakness and really knowing what that means. There's this uh, term that's been defined um, in years recently, and this term is called moralistic therapeutic deism. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, man, that sounds like a pretty technical term. Seems kind of complicated. Really, it's not. It's just a a term that defines a lot of what we find in Christianity today. And really what it comes down to is it's this idea that we believe in God and we we know God exists and we know that God, you know, sent a son to save us, etc., etc. But that's not really the end-all, be-all of God's will as much as it is that we just be good people and we do good things, and if we're good people and we do good things, then what will follow from that is the other thing that God wants for your life, or God's will for your life, and that's that you're a happy person, that you're going to be this morally good person. And so what tends to happen then when we hear sermons or Bible teaching that goes along this line of moralistic therapeutic deism, it's very much a very pragmatic, um, do these things and everything will work out. Don't do these things because if you do these bad things, then that's just going to make your life worse, etc. There's no real understanding that we are wicked and wretched at our core (laughs) because of sin and that we are morally destitute and bankrupt at our core. Really, in moralistic therapeutic deism, there's a general idea that eh, in the long run, we're all basically good people. And if we just live good lives, you know, then God's going to bless us. And this uh, idea is rampant in the church today. In a sense, it's almost like a relativism when it comes to sin and even morality. It's, in a sense, it's almost a Christianized moral relativism to a degree. But it's more so from a, in a sense, uh, even from a pharisaical perspective, because that's almost kind of the way that the, the Pharisees were, right? Like, when you think of the Pharisee and the tax collector and parable that Jesus told on that, and how the, the Pharisee turned his eyes up toward heaven and he thanked God that he wasn't like all of the bad people in the world. And then he lists off all the good things that he's done. And it's like he thanks God because he's like, God, I'm so thankful that I have done all these things. And, you know, in a sense, giving glory to God because of it, but almost glorifying himself to God for all of his accomplishments. To the point that he says, I'm thankful that I'm not like this tax collector. And then the tax collector just gets on his knees and beats beats his chest. And he says, have mercy upon me, O God, I'm a sinner. And Jesus said it was the tax collector that went 
down to his house justified that day. Why is that? Because he recognized that he was nothing without Christ, that he was nothing without God. So there's an article on 1517.org, and this is a, an excerpt from a book called Crucifying Religion that was written by Donovan Riley, which is a 1517 published book in 2019. And a quote talking about moralistic therapeutic deism, Riley says this, he says, at the root, or at root, moralistic therapeutic deism is really about instruction and how to live a moral life. It preaches that God's will for our lives is that we be good and happy. A lot of us would say, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with wanting to be good people or wanting to be happy? Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But giving people instruction on how to live a moral life, rather than giving them the gospel of life and the bread of life and the water of life, Jesus Christ, is a recipe for disaster. Why is that? Well, I have a quote from a guy that we all know and love, Chad Bird, also of 1517 Project. And Chad Bird says, In the hardships of life, as well as in our deepest woes, only in hindsight do we realize the hidden hand of God at work in them. He is not making us stronger, but he's showing us how weak we are in ourselves, that we might live solely in the strength that Christ provides. Moralistic therapeutic deism basically gives you a list of things to do that supposedly are going to make you stronger and make you better and make you happy, whereas Christ comes to show you how much you need him by taking you a lot of times through hardships and trials and weaknesses. You know, a lot of times, rather than looking at the pain and the trials and the hardships that we go through as being somehow God's punishment upon us, because we're not doing all the things. We're not living that moralistic, therapeutic, deistic life. A lot of times what we need to do is we just need to embrace the pain, embrace the weakness. These things in our lives are not problems, that, that our sin is not an affront to God. But there's also the sense in which God takes us through these hard things in our lives to point us to himself and to show us that we can't do it on our own, that we can't do it at all. In Christ has already accomplished it all in our place and for us. But we still we still want to feel like somehow, somehow we have to contribute something. We have to bring some kind of offering to God that will be acceptable so that he will make our lives better. But the truth of the matter is, no matter how much of that stuff we try to do, you still are going to face pain and hardship and trials. And why is that? Because Christ wants us to run to him and not to ourselves, not to our own accomplishments, not to our so-called success. And the truth of the matter is that when those are the things that we're trusting in, our own successes, our own moralistic accomplishment, that's the time when a lot of times Christ comes in with that scalpel or sometimes with that bulldozer to blow it all away to blow it all up so that we realize that stuff was not acceptable to God. What's acceptable to God is understanding your weakness and embracing Christ and knowing that it's in Christ that we are made strong. You know, I do believe that Chad, in sharing that quote, had 2 Corinthians chapter 12 in mind where Paul was talking about his thorn in the flesh and he was dealing with this weakness in his life. And what did God tell him? He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Again, it's that upside-down spirituality or that backwards spirituality that is so antithetical and foreign to our human way of thinking and to the thinking of this world. And it certainly flies in the face of moralistic therapeutic deism. Brothers and sisters, we, this life is hard. This world is broken. We have brokenness in our lives. We have weaknesses. Many times we are weak in our faith, but it's not your faith that sustains you. It's Christ. Many times we are weak in our morals, but it's not your morals that sustain you. It's Christ. Many times we are weak in our thinking and in our emotions. But your thinking and your emotions are not that which sustains you. It's Christ. Many times we think that if I just do all these things on my checklist and I have these successes, that that's going to sustain me. No, those things don't sustain you. 
It's Christ. Christ is the sustainer of your life. You may be thinking to yourself, my life is a wreck right now. How could God love me? How could God care about me? Oh, my friend, you're, you're thinking in the lines of moralistic therapeutic deism. You're thinking that your life and all the good you do is somehow going to be the thing that gets you access to God. That somehow that's going to be the thing that sustains you. But no, it, it is not. Christ is that which sustains you. He's already accomplished everything on your behalf. And when you're struggling in your weakness, when you're struggling in the hurt and the pain of your past, when it's snapping its jaws at you and you don't know what to do, the only thing we can do is that thing that the tax collector did. You get on your knees and you beat your chest and you say, Oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Why is that? Because you are acknowledging the fact that you have nothing and he has everything. If you're struggling with your weakness today, if you're struggling with your lack of assurance, your lack of faith, maybe you're just ready to pack it in today and be like, I'm I'm done trying to be so good. I'm done trying to do all these things because I just am failing miserably at it. And there's no point to it. And how can any of this even be real? Oh, Christ is real, my friend. He's very real. He is there. The problem is that you've been taught moralistic therapeutic deism. And in a sense, you have to deconstruct from that bad way of thinking and that bad way of teaching. And you have to look to what the Bible says. You have to look to who Christ is for you. You have to look to your union in him and also realize that Jesus didn't come here to give you your best life now. He didn't come here to make you a better person. He came to be a substitute and a sacrifice for you and for you to just cast yourself upon his mercy. That's it. And I will say that does have an effect on our lives, but it is long and it is slow and it is a work that he has begun in us that will not be complete and performed until the day of Jesus Christ. I will say this, when you're struggling with that lack of assurance or maybe with that particular sin that you struggle with, when you're struggling with your weakness and you feel like such a failure, the truth of the matter is you are. But Christ came to be the success in your place so that you could cast yourself upon him and be found in him. You can look in the Psalms like David and say, Oh God, forgive me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. As he says in Psalm 51, cry out to God. Look to him. Look at what he's accomplished for you. And that will have an impact on your life. That's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Because it's been on my mind. It's been on my heart. We are all broken people. We are all traveling along this broken road. And the only hope we have is Jesus Christ, the bread of life, the water of life, the truth, the way, and the life. Thanks for joining me along the broken road. We'll see you on Thursday, and then we'll see you back here Tuesday for another episode. God bless.